Hey, check it out. We are going to be celebrating Palm Sunday tomorrow, actually. But we're going to talk about it tonight. What a shock, huh? But you know what? <clears throat> We've all heard this story, you know, a thousand times. So we're going to hear it again tonight, but maybe with a little bit different bend to it. A little bit more personal this time, I think. Um, let me put this one up here. Got my little number system all messed up here. A little bit more personal because we have a whole week now to consider some of this stuff. And we will be going up on the mountain. next. It's next Sunday, right? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I've, uh, I've tried, for those of you that aren't morning people, I tried to get it turned into the Sun Rose service like 10 o'clock-ish or so, you know, like after the sun is up. Yeah, it, it, it's in the same bucket that my floor elevator that brings me up just before service, the cable to go around the sanctuary on, same bucket, man. Oh, well, praise the Lord. So check it out. What is so special about this day anyway? This is our opening question here. What was so special about that day? And what's so special about this day, as a matter of fact? So let's open up some prayer and let's dive right in. Amen. Father, we thank you tonight for everything that you had for us today, Lord. All those that were prayed for today, all those that, that we had an opportunity to share our faith with out there, Lord. And, and Lord, we just we thank you that uh, even with the rain, folks came out there, Father. Nonetheless, Lord, your will be done. So tonight as we open up your word, we invite the Holy Spirit to be with us, to open our eyes and our ears and our hearts for the message you have for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's your first villain. The Lord has need of us. Isn't that good to know that the Lord needs us? Seems like, a, is oxymoron the right term for that one there? The creator of the heavens and the earth has a need for us little specks in the grand scheme of everything, but he really truly does. In fact, he had need for us today out there at Quaid. There was, there was quite a few people, lots of people, in fact, that God prayed for. Who was on the prayer team? out there today. Anybody here? One of you over there? And two of you, three of you. So lots of lots of people actually, uh, you know, come through that booth at events like that. If you've never been to one of these events, I really encourage you to go because it's really, for one thing, it's a lot of fun. But also the, uh, what's the right term here? Judgment. Like sometimes you, you look at people and you're like, yeah, man, they don't want to hear the word of God. They're so hungry for prayer, you, it'll blow your mind, man, how, how much people are open to hearing, hearing the Word of God and being prayed for, amen, and it helps us even outside of events to continue on sharing our faith, amen. <clears throat> so look at Luke 19. We're going to be looking through Luke 19 as we uh, start this thing up, and here's where we pick it up. When, verse 28, when he had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. Now, yeah, I have highlights all over my Bible and stuff like that, but there's little things like he went on ahead that um, I highlighted on there because it's going to pertain to stuff we're talking about tonight, but everything in our life, he always goes ahead of us. Amen? And the sooner you get that through your heart and your head and understand that when God calls you to go do something, he's not just willy-nilly sending you out there and hope everything works out. He's already got it worked out ahead of time, and all we need to do is show up. So he went ahead, going up to Jerusalem, and it came to pass when he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany at the mountain called Olivet that he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village opposite you, where, where as you enter you'll find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, Why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to him, Because the Lord has need of it. That's a kind of a random thing to to say i mean i mean maybe for them it was normal i suppose but for jesus just for for any of us just to say so matt you know go to this little crossroads you know somewhere out in the desert and you're going to find a cvo parked there just grab it all right and if anybody you know says anything about it just tell them the lord has need for it now on a quick note don't go trying that stuff man don't go try to get on someone's motorcycle and go, oh, the Lord has need of it. Amen? Because if the Lord hasn't gone before you like he did here, it might not work out for you. Amen? In fact, you may be standing in the presence of the Lord real quick. 
depending on whose CVO you're trying to take off with there, amen? But look what happened. So those who were sent went their way and found it just as he said to them. He'd gone before. Everything was already pre-planned by God. All we need to do is show up. And, and this is where the need comes in for us, that, that God has a great need for us to go out and share our faith with other people because we all have very unique stories to share. Some of us are, are still, well, not some of us, all of us are still going through our stories that we have to share, but we get fearful of it. We're like, well, I don't know, man. If I go out there, they might think I'm weird, you know, or they might, I might tell them my story, and then they're going to look at me weird, like I'm weird. <laughs> you are weird. So you can move that fear off the table right away. But understand this, that before you've even arrived where you're going to be, he's already got that donkey sitting there at that crossroad, man. It's already set up. And not only that, but it, it's not just that the provision was there, but check out this part here. It says, so those who went in the way um, found it just as they said he would. But as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, Why are you loosing the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. And then they brought him to Jesus. Just like that. Everything was all like, that's just such a strange passage to me, you know, that someone had their little donkey out there tied up, which is probably cruel. I don't know what the story was there. But they went and unhooked it, and the dude came out and go, Boy, what are you doing with my donkey? That the Lord has need of it. And apparently, between verse 34 and th verse 35, the guy said, okay, cool. Off with it you go. He was already prepared for that as well. And, and there's a lot that happens in between 34 and 35 that we don't get. Like, wow, did Jesus have a conversation with him? Did he get Gabriel come and tell him, hey, man, this guy's going to come and take your donkey. Just be cool with it, man. The Lord's got need of it. I don't know what that part is except for faith. Right there is a whole lot of faith going on for those guys. So if we read it in our vernacular, it would be like, hey, why are you loading up my CVO on your trailer, man? The Lord has need of it. Oh, here, let me help you and push it up there and strap it down for you. Wouldn't that be cool in a perfect world where you could just do that? Some of those CVOs are pretty expensive. I've even heard that some of them cost like $70,000, $75,000 around that price range, right? Wow. I, I just got one of those things, uh, you know, that tells you how much you owe on your house. That's almost about half of what I owe on my house right there. Just that. One little motorcycle right there, man. I don't know. They're beautiful. I'm, I'll give you that. Anyway, everything went exactly as the Lord said it would happen. It was, there was, there was nothing, there was no confusion, there was no debate, there was no anger, anything going on or nothing like that. Exactly how he said it was going to happen, it happened. And everything that he calls us to do happens exactly that way right there. As long as we don't get in the way or kind of try to step outside dad's will and do things our own way, you know, put our own spin and our own twist on stuff. If we just trust him, man, when he says go and we go, Things will work in such a miraculous way. It'll blow your mind because you never know who's going to walk in there. It could be like Doc and Winona. Hey, Doc and Winona, how you guys doing? We appreciate that. We appreciate, ever since that leotard incident, we appreciate you wearing your clothes. Amen. And they threw their own clothes on the colt and they sat Jesus on him. So, even, even at this point, they really didn't totally understand what Jesus was doing, but they were being obedient. What? I did what? I forgot the fill in. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I still had my orange, my orange highlighter on 35. That, that's how I visually keep an eye on that stuff. Okay, let's do the next one. Blessed is the king. Where's your little sign, man? Okay, well. Oh, we're not going to fire him, man. He just needs a little more training, that's all. We'll, uh, we'll keep working on it. Okay, so let me regroup and find out. Oh, yeah. So then they, they brought him to Jesus, and they threw their clothes 
on the colt, and they sat Jesus on him. He's preparing to go somewhere and ride in there, and this, this little coat, you know, didn't have anything on Have you ever noticed the little donkeys out there in uh, uh, San Timoteo Canyon? Yeah. Have you ever noticed they got a cross on their back? Really? Yeah, man. I, I thought someone tagged a donkey out there, like a Christian or something out there with a spray can or something, but apparently they all have a little cross, like right on their little shoulders. Isn't that neato? I don't know what it means, but it I just thought it was pretty cool, man. And, I mean, it, it wasn't like the Bible says he crawled on an elephant, man. He crawled on a little donkey, and little donkey's got a cross on their back. God's just good, man. you gotta, you got to look for the little things, man. There's just little things like that. He'll show you, and if for nothing else, put a smile on your face because he just loves to bring joy and happiness into our lives. Amen? So, anyway, here he is coming down this this Mount of Olives, coming down into, into Jerusalem. And, and look what happens here. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road before him. When we get, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you a little bit of prophecy that happened there that um, I would like to think they were all aware of. Maybe somebody made them aware of this. But this whole spreading out of clothes thing is, is, uh, was a symbolic of uh, receiving a king. Like, like back in the Old Testament, there's, there's stories of kings coming, and they would spread their clothes on the ground. And it kind of, uh, we kind of adopted a little bit of that in Hollywood. If you ever watch the, uh, the uh, Walters, what's the, the Walters with the little statue? Oscar. Oscar, right, Oscar. It was somebody like that watching the Oscars. Now I, now I know I can never find it when I Google it. Anyway, they always roll out the red carpet for the dignitaries, you know, or when big important presidents and politicians all come together, you know, they roll out the red carpet. And, and it's the same, the same idea. They were, they were honoring their king or what they, it, it, he, is, he is their king, but it wasn't exactly the king they were expecting at that time time they thought it was going to be something else that we'll get from we get from the lulav the lulav is this is that little uh, bundle of uh it's a palm branch a willow branch and a myrtle branch that are all bound together and they would wave those things and and that was that was symbolic of of victories over enemies we see that in the old testament battles and they wave these things um, kind of like, you know, us waving flags, I suppose, to some degree. But what they're saying there is that they're honoring their coming king and that they're celebrating the victory over their enemy. Now, Jesus is their king, and he was bringing about victory. But what they were looking for was the king that was going to rule over Israel and kick the Romans to the curb and bounce them out of there, and they would have this great victory. But... Of course, we know, because we have the story, that he's the king of kings, first of all, and the victory was over death and the sin in our life. You know, the wage of sin is death, and Jesus would be conquering that death, and, and everybody that called on his name could be saved, amen, and forgiven of their sins. But they were looking at it in a different kind of a, a direction there that I'll get to, but if I say it now... There are going to be cards coming and people in the booth. They're going to be getting all over me. So I'm going to go all the way to the end here of this part. And then I'll go to that fun part. Then as he was now drawing near the sin of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. Now this is where it starts to bring it into to us right here. This is what they said. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So... What they're worshiping him for now is all that, that, that it says right there, the mighty works that they had seen. Not the mighty works they had heard or even that had been passed down through oral tradition. They, see, they saw these things with their own eyes, whether it was things that happened to them personally by Jesus or the things that they'd seen, like you know, blind people getting healed, the lame, um, their limbs being restored or, or dead people being raised, whatever it was. They saw that stuff, and they were worshiping him for that. With all the palm branches, the victory, the king, all this stuff, and they're crying out. And again, in like, uh, I think like Matthew and a couple of the, the gospels, they would shout out, Hosanna, Hosanna, save now. See, 
it, it's all great for us as modern Christians because that all makes sense to us. You know, that, that we're calling on Jesus to save us eternally, our souls. They were calling on him to save them from the persecution they were going through under Rome. They, they didn't see what he truly was. We have that. We have the ability to see Jesus for who he was. So we're, we, got a, we got a big leg up on them that we can spend the whole week taking a look at. But just this one little section right here, what are we worshiping him for? What are the things in our life that we, can, that we can call out to God and say, Bless the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna. I guess the important thing is that we don't forget the things that we've seen. Whether, they're, whether they've been directed to us by God or whether we've seen other people get blessed. Because sometimes the life can really get in the way, man. I don't know if you guys know that or not. But sometimes... You, we can just get hung up on the dumbest stuff, man, and we miss the cool stuff that Jesus is doing in our lives and other people's lives. And the craziest part about that is the dumb stuff makes us feel like crap, and the good stuff makes us feel blessed and whole. But we still tend to gravitate toward that stuff. But like I said, we have a whole week here that we can contemplate and meditate on this before we go up on that mountain and hopefully don't freeze to death up there. But if we do, praise the Lord, amen, we're going to show up to heaven as holy ice cubes, amen, and then we'll be thought out in the name of Jesus, right? It'll be great. It always is, man, because it's hard to play guitar up there when it's like 30 below, man, you know, that's all right, it's going to be okay. But tonight as we're contemplating what we're, as we're going through this study, what are the things that, what are the things that we need to remember and I mean like, remember, dedicate it to our perma memory. I know there's memory issues in this church. I'm certainly one of those people that struggles. With, but I think everybody has that one little piece of our brain that we didn't kill in the 60s and 70s. Um, age hasn't totally taken it out because we can remember things. If we can just focus on some, maybe you need to write it down. Maybe we need to write down some of the, the miraculous things and the blessing Jesus has done in our life so that we might remember him and not drift away from worship. We don't want our worship to become mechanical, you know, where it's, it's, uh, it's because everybody else is doing it at this moment, you know, but as we leave church, then the worship kind of, you know, tapers off until we have our next service and then we can worship again. Worship, singing is one form of worship for sure, but our daily lives ought to reflect the joy and and happiness we have in our in ourselves and if you don't maybe we need to talk about that and we talk to him about that to return the joy of our salvation if we've lost it a little bit because life is you know been been hammering you down i don't know man i've i've uh, it's been it's been a few months now that uh it's not been years actually um that sometimes it's it's i see people just really um, get hung up on on stuff but I know them and I know their lives and I know what God's done in their lives and, and like I want to write a little paper for them and go here you know stick this on your wall or your refrigerator so every morning you can look down there because these are the things you told me that Jesus has done in your life and like oh yeah that was really cool that was really cool that was really cool let's not forget that stuff because our worship can definitely suffer amen and and as believers man we are wired to worship even before we give our life to Christ. We're wired to worship, man. We were made that way. The Psalms tells us you were knitted together that way in our mother's wombs before. And when worship is removed out of our lives and all the forms of worship, not just singing, but all the forms of worship where even we can worship him when, when we're going through stuff, even. We're talking about that all in 2 Corinthians right now where Paul talks about um, that that he he glories in his weakness because he knows when he's weak then he's strong because that's the time that jesus is picking him up like that cool poster the footsteps and stuff like that when the dude got all bent out of shape when there was only one set of footprints and stuff like that what a wah wah story that turned out to be huh ah the worst of times you ditched me you suck and he's like yeah well here's the thing i was carrying you man <laughs> i would have hated to be that guy man I know, I was just kidding. <laughs> right. Okay, so here's the here's that the the prophecy that talks about this day. It was super cool, way back in uh, Zechariah, and it says this. 
Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just in having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, a fowl of a donkey. So clearly that prophecy was speaking of Jesus. And even it even spoke of them shouting Hosanna and their blessings and all that stuff. Talk to them about a king coming. But they might have missed this one part about him being just and having salvation. Because Jesus is just. And, and being, being so, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't, I don't believe that Jesus gets any kind of joy out of rebuke and correcting, but he does that because he loves us. That's also over in Hebrew that he corrects and rebukes those that he loves. And that's an important thing because some of us in this room are prone to doing really stupid stuff sometimes. Look at you guys. Look. <laughs> Who am I looking at? The, the forward-facing camera will reveal all that. You, you guys give yourselves away because all of a sudden you're like looking at your Bible, like, looking down. He, he brought salvation. And, and yes, he, they, they were hoping for salvation from the, the Romans to be saved from all of that going on there. But their bar was set really low, man. The, the Roman thing was a was a temporal thing it was going to come and it was going to go as it did but salvation is eternal man and and they had missed all that stuff and that's the point i'm getting at here is that it's so easy for us to miss the big picture when we're focused on the little junk right in front of us the little pebble that we're worried about slipping on um they he they nailed him riding riding in lowly and riding in a donkey a colt and a foul donkey that lowly part was one of the big problems that some of them were having not this crowd but some of the chief priests some of the, the religious people of the day, they wanted him, they didn't want him on a donkey dressed up like a shepherd. They wanted him coming in on a white Arabian horse with a sword in his hand and, you know, his hair and his beard looking like a lion's mane and stuff like that. And they're like, ah, that ain't our king, man. You know, we'll, we'll recognize our king when he shows up. <sighs> never worked out for Israel when they were picking things like that. Also, um, if, you're, if you're so inclined, you can also go check out Daniel, the chapter 9 of Daniel, the, the prophecy of the 70 weeks, and that's all spoken of. Actually, when you start doing all the numerical stuff of that stuff, where things need, you know, were going to happen at a certain time throughout history, that, that this, this whole day that we're talking about, Palm Sunday, actually was prophesied in that 70 weeks as well. These things happen far before Christ. So, I guess my question would be, are they, are these people that are worshiping somewhat educated, like have they, have they taken the time to find out these things for themselves, or are they just kind of following the crowd? Because the crowd would later on, in the end of the week, go a whole different direction. You know, we get down to uh, Good Friday and stuff like that, where they're not shouting blessings to they're, they're shouting crucify, which doesn't necessarily mean it was the exact same group of people. But nonetheless, the crowds certainly changed their tune by the end of the week. And, and you know, there was a lot of campaigning going on with the, with the chief priests and things like that, um, kind of rumor spreading and all that that led into that. And people bought into it. And even though this stuff's 2,000 years old, you guys, it still pertains to us today, man. You know, it's so easy to get led astray by stuff. Yeah, I was going to use a different word, but I'm on video, so I can't deny it now. Check out Luke real quick. Let me show you something cool over in Luke. Um, Luke, uh, okay, that's where we're going to go then. You notice when, uh, when they were shouting out all that stuff, they said, bless the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. It's not the first time that was shouted in regard to Jesus, actually. In fact, when you go all the way back to his birth, there was an army of angels that shouted this, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace and goodwill towards men. Grace and peace from birth all the way to we're in the, the last week of his life. His ministry has been about grace and peace. They wanted war and peace. Carnage is what they were looking for. Are we that much different than them? 
sometimes uh, we, we love grace and peace, especially when, it, when it's poured upon us. Amen? But we don't always want grace and peace for those out from us. Sometimes we want war and carnage for the people outside of us. And, and that sucks because we're all, you know, we're all Christians. We're new creations. We don't think and act like that anymore, right? <laughs> they were close on, on this one here. The angels spoke of that uh, peace on earth. But when they said it over here, though, back in, in, uh, in Luke uh, 19, they said peace in heaven and glory in the highest. In the first version of it, the angels, they said peace on earth. And that's what Jesus came to bring. But mankind sucks. And there will be peace in heaven before there's peace on earth because this earth is going to go through the worst of the worst war and carnage ever in, in the history of, of the earth ever being here. But there will come a point when it's over. And we've been talking about that with the sheep and the goats and uh, the judgment seat, the great white throne. All that's going to happen, man. And then this is all getting wiped out. Even this cool little church here, believe it or not, is not going to survive that. I know, right? Well, the, the, Bible, the Bible also tells us that he's going to prepare a place for us. Amen? So I wonder, I wonder if we get there. Maybe there'll be a cooler one. Probably not. They'd have to leave all the guns out and all the knives and the military ammunition that's piled up in the front here. You know what? I, I have a feeling that in heaven we're going to have a long, 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 long time just to be on our face before Christ, man. And that's going to be like our, our focal point there. But nonetheless, between now and then, <clears throat> we can produce peace and grace in our sphere. The, the, the circles that we run in here, we can make the choice to, to follow Jesus as Christians, to follow exactly what he came here, blessing, forgiving, and grace unto others. Amen? Unmerited favor. Even though there's some people that don't merit favor from us, some people, they merit, you know, getting socked or something like that. But Jesus, Jesus wasn't like that. And, and when we call ourselves Christians, it, it's almost sometimes we pick and choose the things that we want to we want to be in, in the word. But you know what the crazy thing is? The more Christ-like we act, the better we feel about ourselves. And the better we feel about ourselves, the better we're able to present Christ to a lost and broken world. Even those that, that we're having struggles with, if we can truly learn grace and peace, even, even, uh, even, your, even your enemies will be at peace with you. That's, that's somewhere in the Psalms as well kind of hard to put into words what I'm talking about here, how people will respond differently to you because they see the Christ in you, is what I'm, what I'm trying to say here, as opposed to seeing the you in you. Because sometimes the you in you inspires people just to be mean, man. Um, I, think it, I think it goes along with having a slap me face or something like that. <laughs> Some people just naturally have that faith. People want to give them a fresh one. Amen? So, so blessed is the king that now has need for all of us. Each and every one of us in this room, there's a need. No matter, It could be any number of things that, that he has need for. But if he has need for a little donkey tied up on some road, just imagine what he would do with you if and all of us if we were just a little bit willing to answer the calls when he calls whatever whatever they might be without having a bunch of excuses or reasons or things like that just getting up there and go whether it's just talking to someone praying for someone giving someone a phone call sweeping down the parking lot whatever it is man there's always a big blessing attached to it, and everything has been gone on before we even show up there. And if we get that little nugget in our head right there, it it's almost makes it more exciting as to what does he got planned and what's already set up that I'm not aware of. These guys had it. 
whatever it was, they didn't question him. They, he said, go do this, this is how it's going to be, and phew, down the road they went, and that's exactly what happened. We don't have any explanation here where they're going, that was so freaky, man. That was so weird. That donkey was right where he said it was going to be, and that guy responded. Nothing like that. It was just faith that they ran on, man. What a great concept, right? Faith as believers. Check out this in our special day. Our special day. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Tell them to shut up. They're acting too holy. <laughs> what was happening was people were watching. People were looking and people were becoming interested and more people were coming in from the peripheral to see what the heck was going on, what all this shouting's about, what all this blessing's about, what all this hosanna's about. And the Pharisees' problem was it was going against their order, the way they wanted things to go, the control that they had over the people or that they perceived that they had. Well, I guess they actually, they did have a lot of control over the people, as a matter of fact, because they could make your life really bad. If you didn't play ball and go along with them, they could tell Matt to not clean her carpet because she's not playing ball with us. She's one of those Jesus freaks, the way. And she's got other things, too. And if you do, you'll never clean another carpet in Jerusalem again. And people were put in those positions that way. And they, they had little backroom deals with the Romans that they could get in there and snatch your property and your animals and things like that. We saw that with Matthew and other tax collectors that had kind of that little deal going with Rome. It was a, it was a very corrupt time. And uh, politically speaking, even though those were religious circles, they were still the politicians of the day. And... No matter what direction you looked, there was some form of corruption going on somewhere from the highest levels to even the lowest levels. Praise the Lord. We don't deal with that in our country. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, man. So tell them to shut up. They were panicking right there. And, and here's the crazy thing. that Normally when the Pharisees or the, the chief priests would, would bark orders, people would listen. They weren't listening right now, man. They were focused on Jesus. There was something about him, man, that drew people's attention. And Jesus answered and said this, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. There's no shutting up the word of God. There's no way to stop it. You can't stop it. You can't be stopped. If she's, not, if she's not out there shouting, she'll be out there shouting. He'll be out there shouting. They'll be out there shouting. You can chase them down all you want, but you're never going to stop the word of God from going forth, ever. And it hasn't, even to this day. Today was a good example. Out there in the rain, man, the word of God was going out. It turned out to be a really good day. But look what he says here. Now, as he drew near, he just kind of blew them off with that. Give them that little nugget to think about. Because now they're going to go into some room together and like, okay, what did he mean by stones? And they all start writing stuff down and stuff like that. So do you think he was talking about the big stone that looks like a skull? Or was he talking about the little stones that are like in the river there, the Jordan, all that? It's just so goofy. How much time is wasted thinking about goofy stuff? But nonetheless, as he drew near, coming to Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it. Have you ever noticed that Jesus weeps over other things? He never weeps over himself. You ever see that? Like we're like even even in the garden, you know, when he was praying to his father in on Friday, when we're gonna get up to that thing, that if there's any other way this this cup can pass before me, the cup of his crucifixion, the the passion. But nonetheless, not my will be done, but your will. He never wept about himself. He wept when Lazarus died. He didn't weep over Lazarus dying. He wept over their unbelief when he got there. And it's the, the, shortest, the shortest verse in the Bible. And it, it broke his heart. They were, he was friends. They were, 
they were close, and he saw the pain. You know, our, our pain hurts him. Anybody, you guys realize that, that when, when we hurt, it, it hurts our Lord and Savior, too. When, when we do things that are, that are I guess, uh, not, there's a lot of reasons why people hurt, but things that, that we bring about ourselves, the, the pains in our lives that, that are so easily avoidable, but yet sometimes we still get drawn into things like that. It, it bothers him because it, it, we're going down roads that aren't part of his plan, that going ahead of us. Man, have you ever thought about this for a second? What, from this day, from this moment right now, what are his plans for you just tonight? From when you leave this church and outward you go, do you, do you think maybe there aren't any plans for you tonight? Are you just, you know, good luck getting through the crowds and all that stuff? Every moment of our life is planned out by God. Amen. And, you know, I know that seems like a weird thing to think, but you know what? If we really talk to him about that, I go, Lord, you know what? Show me the way. Peter Brown to rip that out, by the way. <laughs> Show me the way that you want me to go, and, and I'll go. I mean, if we're genuine about that stuff, just imagine some of the places that God would take you in your life. Just from, from this parking lot outward. Who knows, amen? But we get all hung up sometimes and stuff, but you know, we don't have to. And that's what this whole week's about. That why I said I was bring it personal. We have a whole week to contemplate, to think about this stuff, to meditate on this stuff, and go, Lord, you know, what is it that, that you're you're desiring to show me? What in the word is it that you want me to focus on? You know, what are what plans do you have for me? Direct my path, Lord. Just I'm wide open to you. Whatever you want is what I desire. What a crazy week this could be for somebody or all of us, amen? I don't know, just food for thought right there. Anyway, he said, this is why he wept, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the, the day that he, he had come to reveal himself, there was a lot that was going on and why Jesus did it. This wasn't something that Jesus did. We don't, we don't read in here where he put on big events and stuff like that, you know, to glorify himself. But truthfully, the... The chief priests, the Pharisees, they weren't getting the job done, man. They they were still having meetings and doing all their little backdoor scheming. And, and he kind of spurred them on. He almost set them up to some degree because what we're going to see at the end here was just more of them, of him kind of pushing, pushing on them. But for the people, though, this was their moment to recognize that he is the king of kings, that he did come in grace and peace, that he had Everything of his life was built up for them on that day and what was about to come in that week right there. And he said, if you, if you, even you, especially in your day, the things that make you peace, let's see, even if you had known, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Yeah, there's another thing for remembering right there, looking back on our lives. What brought us peace in our life? What brings you peace in your life? What are things that bring you peace? Does prayer bring anybody peace? Peace? Sunshine, that brings peace too, yeah. How about knowledge of blessing? When you know that God did something miraculous in your life or in the lives of somebody else, does that bring you any peace? How about just spending time with the Lord, man? You know, we talk about it all the time, being in your word, falling in love with your word, devotionals in the morning, things like that. Does anybody get any peace out of that? When the, you know, we all do, man. When we take time to be, to be in our word, and, I'm not, and again, I'm not talking mechanical here. That just sucks. It, it's worthless, man, just to grab a Bible. I mean, I don't say it's worthless. That's not true because God's word never goes out and comes back void. But when we just go to say, well, I'm going to read 10 verses today, you read the 10 verses, you're like, okay, I got my 10 in, and you shut the book. You're probably not going to get a ton out of that little nugget right there. But when we purposefully go, you know, Lord, show me something today. He will blow your mind, man. Even with, you know, the daily bread and stuff like that, when you'll open something up and it'll, it'll be pertaining to stuff that's going on in your life right now. It's like the freakiest thing, man. Almost always there'll be something that's going on. If you're willing to open your heart and just trust him to reveal something to you. But you got to be open, man. You got to be willing to receive and then you got to be willing to follow whatever his will is on the other side of that. That sometimes is a problem, can be a little bit of a problem. But we can't be like the end of verse 42 here. But now they are hidden from your eyes. 
and it's easy to get stuff hidden from our eyes about Jesus, man. The world, bills, relationships, all kinds of crazy stuff, man. The news, if you, if you spend way too much time, you know, on the news, watching the news, you'll just want to jump off a cliff somewhere, man. There's no hope. Things that we could spend, we could better spend time on, that's what we want to take a look at this week. The things that we just, we do, we gravitate towards, whatever, that, that pull us away from God. And I'm not necessarily saying they're bad, you know, good or bad, but maybe throughout this week here, intentionally take some time. I know I talk about this all the time. I'm always trying to get you guys to do devotionals and read the Bible. But there's a reason, because it's cool. Maybe just this week, just give it a try. I mean, what's the worst that could happen for you? You feel good? You feel peace and joy in your life? Ooh, egads, you know? Just spend a little time with the Lord. You know, if, if like, reading the Bible is difficult or, or whatever, that's cool and sort of, but not totally. But grab a daily bread, man. Um, or if you really want to... You really want to have some fun? Go down to Salem and buy one of those little Bible studies. It, it might be on Ephesians or it might be on a subject or something. Maybe it's on communion or something like that. And just sit there and take a look at it, man, and look through it. You'll be amazed what you can pick up from these little moments of time that God spends with you because, man, he is going to maximize it for you if we're just willing to take the time and not let it be hidden from our eyes. The, the enemy's very skilled at hiding things from us in regard to the word. Very skilled in, in ways that you might even not realize that he's using to hide things from us. He says, for the days will come upon you when your enemy will build up and banquets around you, surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground and, and they will not leave they were not leaving you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. They were too busy or too distracted to see. Today's a great day for your visitation, for, for you to allow Jesus to come into your life and just show you some cool stuff. There's a lot of destruction here. And, and this is certainly, Jesus is certainly referring to the destruction um, by Titus in 70, 71 AD, when they surrounded Jerusalem and starved them, and the, there's a there's a there's literature called the I can't remember the it's Josephus, but there's another thing in front of Josephus, like the Chronicles of Josephus or something like that. Anyway, it goes into great detail what happened in Jerusalem during that siege, and it is absolutely horrifying the stuff that happened inside the walls of that city while they were surrounded and the things that they they did to each other inside there as well but for us the same thing the same thing happens to us when these when the enemy starts building walls around us and embankments and we start getting into a whole lot of stinking thinking man because you've got the blinders up all around us and the big high walls and before long we start getting leveled spiritually, man, stone by stone by stone, things that we built up over the years. And, and truly, at the end of all that stuff in Rome, they did tear that temple down. I've never been there yet, maybe someday, I don't know. But the big wailing wall is the foundation where the temple sat. And from what I've read, you can still see the stones, right, down below where they pulled the stones down and rolled them into a valley or some crazy thing like that. Because all the, you know, on the inside of that temple was super cool. This is cool, but not nearly as cool as the temple was that had all the gold, and, and when they lit it, it melted into the stones, and they took the dang thing apart, man, like a jigsaw puzzle to get to all that gold. So, yeah, that prophecy that Jesus just shared with them right now actually came to pass, and the whole thing came down. How many years have we been walking with the Lord, and what a shame would it be to have what we've built torn down? stone by stone because we're allowing the enemy to hide things from our eyes and right now we're in we're in probably the most pivotal point in christian history what jesus was about to do here first of all he didn't have to do it 
and there was no way they'd have got him on that cross if they didn't if he didn't want him to but it was because of him and not just the cross and the the sacrifice and the beatings and everything that he did the death it was the resurrection that's the keystone of our christian faith is the resurrection lots of people have given their lives through the years in the holy land through all the years claimed to be messiahs and things of that nature but they never were resurrected they're still deader than fried chicken wherever the heck they ended up getting buried or burned or whatever the heck happened to them jesus defeated death defeated death that's great for us great news for us because up until that point there death meant death that was that but jesus showed that he is god and not only is he god but since the wages of sin is death the only thing that could that could that could battle that was a resurrection and and the only one that could do that was the one and only lamb of god and he did it he's alive man he's a, next friday we're going to talk about well saturday we'll be talking about all the horrors that took place on that friday and the things of that nature but sunday morning man we're going to be up there on that mountain when that sun comes up over those the peaks and yeah it is a little bit chilly but it's not unbearable all right but when you see that sun peak up over those mountains right there you'll understand why you took that time to go up that mountain every single year it's a glorious thing to see man and it stirs our very souls amen he defeated death once and for all though so all this stuff that we're talking about right now was him leading up to that day that important weekend right there and he goes on to say this then oh sorry did, did i miss one i did huh hold on you look at he's like a switchblade man he's got that thing like a little chinese throwing star okay i'm i'm turning to psalms 118 now yeah i caught myself that's growth right there amen the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone the one that they said ain't our messiah he ain't our king ain't no way that's gonna happen he became the cornerstone of the faith and the cornerstone is that big stone they don't use them anymore but back in the day, there was a big old giant stone that would set the entire attitude of the building. How, not like a good or bad attitude, you know, like a mean building or a happy building, but the way the building was going to be built, how it would be, how it angled, the direction it would go. And the cornerstone, usually they put like the big circa, you know, 1912 or whatever, or they'd put some cool plaque on there or something like that. But it is the foundation stone, the thing that everything was set on. So all of our faith, all of the word, Everything that is now, that has been, and will come, still yet to come for all eternity, he is the cornerstone. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of it all. And somewhere back there, that group of people anyway said, nope, he ain't the one. He's not going to play ball with us. He's not corruptible, so right off the bat, we don't like him. We can't buy him. He doesn't look right, and he rides donkeys instead of horses or whatever their goofy excuses were. But we all know that by the grace of God, we are Jesus freaks, and he is our cornerstone, and he's our king and our master. Amen. And he says this, this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes, and it is truly marvelous in our eyes. I'm, I'm so grateful to be a Christian. I truly am. There was a lot of years that I wasn't a Christian. There's probably some of you in here. A lot of years you weren't Christians either. But you know what? I've been, it's been a really, really good 27 some odd years. I don't even know how long it's been now. I can't even, it's, I can't even, I can't remember what my life was really like before Christ. It's hard to even to think of what it was. But I know it wasn't great. Nonetheless, it is marvelous in my eyes. All of this is marvelous in our eyes, even though it's brutal and it's it's filled with all kinds of ugliness and things of that nature. All through it all, though, I see his smile in his eyes looking through all of this junk, man, because he's got a plan. Amen. And just because they're not willing to, to open their eyes to it doesn't mean that we're not. Amen. Well, there's a whole bunch of people right outside that door that are blind as bats out there, man. And it, and I would say it's getting worse too with the advent of social media and all the ability to spread a bunch of stupid nonsense out there but look what he says this is the day the lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it so which is the day yesterday today so tomorrow we could read this same passage 
and then tomorrow would be this is the day. And we could rejoice and be glad in it, right? right. Or we could get hung up on a bunch of junk again. I don't know if has, have any of you ever gone to like gone to sleep pissed off about something and then woke up the next morning like more pissed off about whatever it was that you were pissed off the night before. <laughs> Anybody ever do that? What a waste of time. And it's usually something really dumb, huh? Like something that's really not that big of a deal. But then look at what the option is. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Every morning, man, we can wake up and go, well, there's a new day, Lord, for you to do your thing. Here I am. Send me. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. Whatever it is, I know you've gone before me just like you did that little donkey, man. And I'll be that little donkey. I'll be the best dang little donkey you've ever dealt with. Amen. Uh-uh. Exactly. Right? Now, this isn't actually in there because uh, I didn't, I forgot to send the rest of this to Bruce but, or Amy. But anyway, we'll wrap it up right here then because it's important. Then he began, then he, then he went to the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in it, saying to them, it is written, my house is a house of prayer, but you have made it into a den of thieves. Now, certainly this would spur on the priest and the Pharisees even more because he's going in there and flipping money, changing tables over. So probably in the court of the Gentiles, but no doubt is where this would be set up. And they had, uh, you had to bring money in and wherever you were from, it had to be temple money. And so they would convert your money, kind of like if you go to Israel, you need Israeli money and stuff like that. But they would charge ridiculous amounts. And then if you needed, like, a, you bring your sheep or your doves or whatever in for sacrifice, and they'd be like, yeah, those aren't too cool, man. They're like blemish. But lucky for you, we got a pen over here, a pre-approved, pre-approved pigs. Well, not pigs, no. Sheep, that's the end. I was thinking pre-approved Harleys right now, and a hog popped into my head. Like, you, know, you walk in a deal, you go, you're pre-approved. I'm like, yeah, 45%, yeah. Pre-approved sheep and, and doves, man, they're, they're already okay. They got the stamp okay, and you know, we only want you know, 500 bucks a sheep for it. And here's the thing. If, if their sheep wasn't approved by the the corruption there, they couldn't get their sacrifice done. So wherever they traveled all the way from, they were really at their mercy, man, to pay whatever it was. And Jesus was going, this, this, is, this is beyond ridiculous. And, and he went in there and he started turning all their tables over. So all the people, you know, the, they're real careful about stacking all their coins and stuff up, you know, getting them all nice and pretty. And a dude come by, boom, hits the table and coins going everywhere. I could just see them all like banging heads trying to, grab their money and or everybody else's money and stuff like that the point was they had turned his house into something other than what it was called to be it said this is a house of prayer and you turned it into a den of thieves and we got to be careful in it because here's a, here's a tough one man jesus himself said that we are the temple of god our bodies we are the temple the holy spirit is and dwell within us what are we doing in our own bodies man are we allowing thievery of any sort to come in there's, there's all kinds of crazy stuff. I wrote a few down here, but I have so many notes I lost track of it. It had to do with things like, um, I gotta find it now because I can't remember what I wrote. Peace and glory, consider all the things. Oh, it's down here. I didn't highlight it. See what happens when my brain is wired, man. I'm telling you to do just what it says. Oh, here we go. What are we robbing from dad? I found it. Yay. Obedience, time, purity, worship. There's other things down there. But what are the things that we're doing with this temple? Our, our life, our, not just our bodies, man, but our spirit our mind, our soul, what, what does our temple look like? If right now Jesus came in and said, okay, it's temple clear in time, line up, would, would he be breaking a sweat in you to clear the temple out, man? You know, are there tables that ought not be here, man? Think about that this week as we're coming up on the sacrifice that he made for us. And it wasn't just a dying thing, man. There was a whole bunch of horrible stuff that 
that took place before that. But, but probably the worst part of it all is that separation between him and his father on that cross when he took on the sins of the world. Imagine how that must have felt for him. But he did it on our behalf. Do you think maybe we could get in there with a broom and do a little temple cleaning ourselves before we come up on next Sunday when we go up there to, to worship our king and our risen savior? Wouldn't it be cool to be able to go up there and go, Lord, I cleaned this out, man, and I did it for you. Because I, I desire to be closer to you, but this day, I want to honor it differently this year, man. I want to try something different and actually pull my head out of my hat for this day. And this is what I'm laying on your throne. Is anybody, you think anybody is willing to do that for this week? You think? One or two of you? All right, that's cool. We'll see what happens. And he was teaching daily in the temple. But the chief priests and scribes and leaders of the people sought to destroy him. Why? Because he was teaching in the temple. And same thing for us this week. See why I'm bringing this a very personal thing? Every day this week, Jesus can be teaching in the temple. What temple? This temple. Us, right here. Every day this week. Just try it, man. I know Denver's asking a lot now. He wants me to be in my word every day for a whole week. I know. He gods, man. Oy vey. What a slave driver I am. Why don't you just give it a shot, man? Pick up one of those daily breads. Because that's just crazy. People don't know how. I don't even know where to start. Okay, that, I understand. But you know what? Grab a daily bread and take it in the restroom. Everybody does that every day. This is going to this is gonna freak you guys out. Leave your cell phone in the living room. And just go in there with your daily bread. I dare you. I double dog dare you. I would say take a picture to prove it, but that's just getting weird. And you would have to have your cell phone to do it, right? So if you actually took a picture of yourself in the restroom going, I'm reading my daily bread, as awkward as that would be, we'd all go, hey, you took your cell phone in there, man. I want to share something with you. Life can go on without a cell phone attached to you every moment of your life. Amen? For some of you that have been here long enough know that this is how far our conversations on the phone used to go. The phone on the wall and the receiver in our hand and that little curly cord stretched out, man. That's as far as you got right there. That was the extent of privacy. Yeah. My mom had one that was like 10 feet long. She could like go under the kitchen table and into the hallway, get it under the door. And if you put your head right by the crack of the door... But the chief priests and scribes and the leaders of the people sought to destroy him because he was teaching. And, and he, was, he was pushing them away from their, their control. The enemy's got all kinds of control over all kinds of things in our life. Amen. And, and he doesn't want any of you in this room spending any time in the Word this week. I promise you that. I guarantee you he's, he's not going to want to do that. He's going to want to try to stop you and get in the way. You know what? That's all part of the ride, man. When you guys do this. Let me know. Like, yeah, man, as soon as I did, you know, this or this happened. I got a phone call, blah, blah. Recognize going into it, man. The enemy will attack. But Jesus is already on the other side of all this stuff, man. And the donkey is tied up over there. We just got to get through it. He says, <clears throat> and we're unable to do anything for all the people were very attentive to him. We can be those attentive people now. And the enemy can't do nothing about it, man. These guys were trying because he was teaching, but they couldn't do anything because the people had their eyes on him. Amen? Here's the get it for tonight, or the application. Why, what has Jesus done for you that causes you to praise him? I think that's where it needs to start. We need to look at our lives and go, man, what has the Lord done for me? And you guys all know stuff. Like well, yeah, everything, but I mean, look, at, look to your children. Look to your grandchildren. Look to your friends and people in your life. There's all kinds of stuff, but mostly look to your own heart and remember the things that he's done and not forget to call out. Blessed is the King of Kings. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for your word, Lord, and we thank you for such a great day out there on the road, Lord. That was really awesome there and all those that we were able to talk to today, Lord. We thank you for that. We look forward to the next one that's coming up as well, Lord. But right now our desire is that everybody knows your son is Savior, Lord, that this whole week is a very important week for them and for us, Lord, as well. But right now, for those that are seeking him, 
as their Savior, Lord. We invite your Holy Spirit to have his way in this room out through that camera right there, Lord. This is a very special day. In fact, Lord, this is the day that you made for them. So, Father, we ask you that you open hearts and have your will in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Father God, I sing it in you, Lord, and I ask you to forgive me my sin. And, Lord, I ask you in my heart to be the Lord and Savior of my life, to fill me with your Holy Spirit and put me on that road that you'll have me travel in Jesus' name. Amen? All right. He's good. A whole week, you guys. Grab a daily bread on your way out if you don't have them at home. I'm just asking you to give it a try. You won't be sorry. Amen? I promise you. There's going to be girls praying over here, guys praying over here. Come up and get some prayer. Don't be a wayer. And I will see you on um, Tuesday, I guess. Keep your eyes on Jesus. God bless you guys.